Every nation has its own way of trying to stop people smashing their lives to pieces with drugs. In this episode, we focus on two of the most radically different approaches to drug policy on the planet. It's rehab versus prison, to criminalization versus death, Portugal versus the Philippines. In 2001, Portugal decided to stop treating drug users like despicable pariahs. The government agreed that no matter what drug you were caught taking, whether it was coke, smack, pingers or puff, you would no longer be punished. Overnight, they decriminalized the personal use and possession of all drugs. Why? Well, back in the 1990s, Portugal faced a barely comprehensible crisis. It was estimated that one in every 100 people in the country was addicted to heroin. Everything else they tried failed, so they tried decriminalization. I think a lot of the motives for the, for the policy were that at that time, there was a lot of concern about heroin use and the problems that families were having with that. People knew their brothers, their sisters, their cousins, their friends, knew someone or were themselves having problems with heroin. And the idea was not to try and split society up into the people who are or aren't using heroin, but to bring people who had problems into the fold and, and help them with those problems rather than continue criminalizing them. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the Philippines. When the Filipino people elected Rodrigo Duterte president in 2016, they made a choice. They'd grown tired of those dealing and using methamphetamine, and at Duterte, they found a man eager to hand out some punishment. These guys are being searched really thoroughly. They're looking in all of their pockets, their baseball caps, asking them to stick their tongues out so they can see if they're hiding drugs in their mouth. He's a user. He's a user? Yes. How do you know? He, uh, he's look. He looks like one? Uh, yeah. You can tell by the yeah. way that he looks? Uh. No. Okay. But are you worried about your, your safety now? Why? I don't. For the last four years, the news in the Philippines has been more or less the same every day. At night, the police go into the slums and people are shot dead. My campaign against drug will not stop until the last drug lord are... Voted in on promises to kill every drug dealer and user in the country, Duterte is on a mission to wipe out crystal meth, known locally as Shabu. In the summer of 2020, the UN reported that between 8,000 and 25,000 people had already lost their lives in the president's relentless war on drugs. People killed either by the national police force or assassins. In Portugal, drug users are treated like healthcare patients, unwell individuals who need help and rehabilitation before they're integrated back into society. In Duterte's Philippines, thousands of people with similar problems are killed on the streets each year by those who are meant to protect them. Every night, someone dies. You just have to wait. But which approach is most effective? A compassionate and rational approach underpinned by a nuanced understanding of human addiction and the financial benefits of treating it, or killing people until the bad drugs go away. These days, the Portuguese approach is seen as an example for other countries to follow. After registering over 280 drug deaths in 2016, Norway signaled its intent to follow Portugal's lead towards decriminalization in a landmark vote. Last year, we had double amount of people dying from overdoses than in the traffic. So it's, it's a huge problem. But what's your ambition? If you use illegal drugs, you get a quick response from society. You meet with, uh, with skilled people from the health system uh, and, you get, and you get help. Some countries have gone even further than decriminalization. In 2013, Uruguay became the first country on earth to legalize recreational cannabis. The consumption of marijuana is a system. There are 200,000 Uruguayos, more or less, that consume. And there is a market clandestine. Nosotros queremos ponerlo en la legalidad, pero cuando empieza a tener problemas de dependencia muy grave, lo pasamos a salud pública. ¿Por qué optamos en este camino? Porque hace 100 años que en el mundo se está reprimiendo el narcotráfico y cada vez estamos peor. Pepe, uh, I know that you're against smoke marijuana, but it's legal to do it recreationally, and I'm wondering. Do you mind if I do a J? 
por favor. No tengo, no tengo prejuicio ninguno. But Portugal wasn't always so chill about drug takers. Its decriminalization act was kind of a last resort. For decades, things were far less lenient. The country's heroin problem has its roots in the events of 1974, when the authoritarian regime of Antonio Salazar ended in a military coup. Suddenly, Portugal was open to the world after 40 years of imposed ignorance and isolation. The modern world came flooding in. That sounds good, but culture shock was inevitable. Under Salazar, Coca-Cola had been banned, and you needed a license to own a cigarette lighter. To say Portugal wasn't ready for Class A drugs was an understatement. Their arrival, however, was inevitable. Portuguese soldiers returned from the country's newly independent colonies with mysterious narcotics. The most damaging of these was heroin. Fast forward 15 years, and these were the scenes in Lisbon's Casal Bentoso neighborhood. If you visited in the 1990s, you might find as many as 5,000 addicts wandering the streets, scoring smack, shooting up, and dozing off. Back then, Casal Bentoso was Europe's foremost open-air drugs market. And nationwide, the numbers made for dismal reading. 100,000 heroin addicts, the largest HIV infection rate in the EU, a surging prison population, over half of which were drug offenders. Only after years of punishment did Portugal decide to try something different. Decriminalization made 2001 a transformative moment for Portuguese society. Today, the numbers look a lot better. Deaths caused by overdose have fallen dramatically. In 2015, Portugal had the lowest drug-induced death rate in Western Europe, 10 times lower than the UK, and 50 times lower than the US. The National Health Ministry estimates that the number of active heroin addicts has dropped from 100,000 in 2001 to fewer than 25,000 today. However, every society has its own story. The Philippines isn't Portugal. When the UN says as many as 25,000 people have been killed in Duterte's war on drugs, it's tough to process how a country could have got to that point. Duterte remains really popular in the country. Just like in many parts of the world, drugs are seen as an evil, and people who use drugs are seen as people who deserve to be punished, and if necessary, be killed. Maybe there are further clues to be found in the recent history of the Philippines. In 2015, Filipino police arrested a man named Horatio Hernandez Herrera, an alleged third in command of Mexico's infamous Sinaloa drugs cartel. Traditionally, the drugs market in the Philippines has been controlled by Chinese crime syndicates. Herrera's life imprisonment on trafficking charges suggested Mexican cartels were also now working to flood the Philippines with meth. What's more, it seemed that those tasked with stopping that happening, the police, the judiciary, politicians, were not as vigilant as they might have been. And what do you think it is about the Philippines that is so attractive to these foreign cartels? The perceived corruption among the pillars of the criminal justice system. One mayor was arrested transporting hundreds of kilograms of meth using the local ambulance of the municipality. Wow. There were even reports that cops were actively protecting the drug dealers. Do the police often try and break up your operation? Yes, Manila's poorest population are scared now, but they were scared before Duterte too of local gangs and dealers and foreign traffickers like Herrera. Gangs don't fear the yes. police. The gangs don't fear. Those uh, drug peddlers don't fear. If the death penalty should come back in our uh, justice system, I think the best. So are you worried for your safety by doing it? Yes, of course. I'm very much worried with my safety. My whole family is uh, living in this area. In June of 2019, poll found that 82% of Filipinos surveyed were satisfied with Duterte's war on Shabu. But understanding why a policy might have become popular isn't the same thing as being able to say it works. In 2017, Romeo Caramat oversaw the deadliest day of Duterte's tenure so far. He was police chief in the Manila district where 32 people were killed in 24 hours. Three years later, Caramat, in his new role as head of drug enforcement for the National Police Force, gave an interview to Reuters. He admitted the violent approach was failing and the drug supply was still rampant. Street prices for Shabu are actually lower than when the war on drugs began in 2016, and users and dealers continue to buy and sell, even under pain of death. 
Meanwhile, Filipino prisons remain rammed with drug offenders. This is Manila's Quezon City Jail. Over 3,500 inmates are packed into a space built for just 800. Under Duterte, prison populations, as well as death rates of drug users, are booming. How do you measure the success of a drug policy? If you're aiming for spacious prisons, safer streets, and fewer addicts, as is the case in Portugal, then the Philippines is categorically failing. However, if your gauges are voter approval ratings and dead drug users, maybe Duterte's war starts to look a little more like success. We'd like to congratulate drugs for winning the war on drugs.